It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network, brought to you by Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. All right, we have a week to go before the All Star break. Uh, The Yankees will play on the road. The Mets will play uh, this afternoon in what will be steamy Pittsburgh. And then we'll uh, come home to play Washington and Colorado. Let's start with the Bombers first, who dropped another series, getting blanked last night by the Red Sox. So the Red Sox energized, come into the stadium, win two out of three. Uh, And again, the Yankees have trouble with their offense. At least he'll pitch well last night. Uh, But, again, they ran into a couple of Yankee killers who just continue to just give them all kinds, all kinds of trouble. I mean, uh, Devers is the ultimate, ultimate Yankee killer. He has been that, and he continues to be that in every way. Um, I was surprised last night. First of all, I have to tell you, I was surprised that... um, that he'll came out for another inning after finishing up the way he did. It looked like he was all done. All right, you wanted to bring him out to face a right-handed hitter? He did. I was very surprised he left him in the game to face Devers there. Devers is a dead red hitter. He owns the Yankees. He has just demolished Cole. I mean, he's hit eight home runs off Cole in his career and had another one Saturday and then leaves him in there. Now the ball to left field just got out. Okay. It just got out. It was a night where it was, the ball was not traveling very well, especially to that part of the ballpark, but he got the ball out. And then, uh, Raphael who continues to kill the Yankees too. And is an incredibly productive, uh, nine hitter shades of Scott Brocious. Um, beats the Yankees or hits another home run to give the Yankees uh, more problems. The Red Sox get set, some separation, hand the ball off to the bullpen, and coast to a 3 nothing win. And the Yankees hit the road against Tampa and Baltimore. They have played very poorly against the division. They are under 500 against the division. Uh, they've lost 5-7 of seven to the Orioles, and right now they're four behind the Orioles in the loss column. And the Red Sox are just three behind them in third place in the loss column. So nothing is good right now. The Yanks are 6-16 six and 16 in their last 22, the worst record in baseball. And they have squandered that wonderful record they had. They are now 18 games over 500. If the Yankees, who right now are 55-37, and 37, which means they have 70 games left, if they went 35-35, and 35, they'd win 90 games because they had such a good start. They, you have to hope the Yankees can play better than 35 and 35 the rest of the way, but they have been just 6 and 16 in their last 22. They can do nothing right. Uh, Judge is right now in a two for 20, and that doesn't help in a lineup where there is not a lot. The Yankees need help. What do they want to fine tune? We will see as they finish this week. First for three at Tampa. Tampa, every time they get above 500, they slip back. They went to uh, Texas and got swept this weekend after they had gotten above the 500 mark. Uh, and then they see the Orioles, who would love to put some more separation between themselves and the Yankees in those last three games before the All-Star break. And a lot of the Orioles are going to the All-Star break. Three of the Yankees are going to the All-Star break as of right now, and that, of course, is the big two. And Holmes, who, let's be honest, and this is not an attack on Holmes, although I seem to always be attacking him for something. Uh, he's not an All-Star, let's be honest. Uh, he's not had an All-Star first half. So he should not be an all-star. But uh, he is, and that's the way it goes. Uh, But the Yankees need to add help. There's no question. They have to look at this realistically and realize when they come back after the break, they have a sprint. They're trying to win a division that will be very important to win if they have designs on the World Series for the first time in eons. Uh, Yes, they'll be able to make the playoffs, courtesy of their first two months this year and their wonderful start. We saw them flirting with 700 baseball, and right now they're under 600 baseball for the first time in a very, very long time and continue to play very poorly. They need a they need Stanton back in the lineup. I never thought I'd say that. They need to make some subtle changes. They don't need to add a lot, but they need to add the right bat. 
and they obviously need to add whatever pitching help they can get, starter, reliever, take all comers. We take starters, take relievers, take whatever they can get their hands on. I actually have an idea that probably won't happen because it's very hard for them to make a deal because it's, it's just human nature. When you play in the same town, and the Yankees and the Mets, obviously I'm talking about here, if you play in the same town – your mistake comes back to haunt you on a daily basis. And that's what's tough about it. If you lose the trade badly and you're the guy you give up plays well or really well, you see him every day and it's hard to take. Um, To me, a perfect, perfect addition for the Yankees is McNeil. Number one, he is miserable with the Mets. The Mets can't stand the look of him anymore. He can't stand the Mets anymore. And he hasn't been happy there in a long time. Let's be honest. He doesn't fit in. They like Iglesias more than they like him. We know that. He's no more than a platoon player at best right now. And a lifetime 290 hitter, the guy's hitting 214 with a 5, you know, 90 OPS. This is a guy who 800 is not, a, is not an unreasonable OPS. This is a guy who, on a good year, can get 50 in homers and you know 40 doubles. Uh, he is just not doing anything. And he is the... First of all, he needs to change the scenery. He's a lifetime 290 hitter. We know that. He's a lot better than he's looked. He's very unhappy now. He just desperately needs a change of scenery. Number two, that is the kind of left-handed bat that with a subtle adjustment can be deadly at Yankee Stadium. I'm talking about doubles and homers on a pretty regular basis at home. First of all, he hits a lot of doubles. Secondly, he could hit 10, 12 homers as a Yankee with just a slight adjustment in the last 70 games. Now, I don't expect them to make a deal for the reason I mentioned. It's very difficult for them to make a deal, but... The Yankees have a million guys in the minors, in the high minors, who could go into the Met bullpen. They got them in droves. The Mets would probably take any one of a million of them for McNeil. They can't stand McNeil. We know that. It just is one that I think fits. He can play multiple positions. He could DH. You don't really want him to DH because you've got Stanton, but he could play multiple positions. He can play a good second base, and if anybody's worn out, is welcome on a day-to-day basis this year as Torres. And he could give you a really big lift where it's not a outrageous to think a guy who's hitting 214 in the middle of a season who's a 290 hitter could hit 320 the rest of the way. It's not outrageous if he's a happy, productive player and he gets the right backing and gets the right coaching and just is happy for a while. Plus, with a tweak of him just pulling the ball, he could... Now, I'm not asking him to go back to 2019 when he hit 20-something home runs, I'm t- I, but he could really be extremely dangerous. And that's a cheap get, who I think could be highly productive and, and versatile could do a lot of things, could come off the bench, could do, could help you in a variety of positions and in a variety of ways. You could play the infield, could play the outfield, could play multiple infield positions. I, I just think it's something I would go after because I just think he needs to get rescued. He needs to get out of there. I was thinking that when I was watching him, and I sat right next to the dugout when, uh, for the first Yankee Met game, and I – was watching him, and I could just see how he just came across to me as being so utterly unhappy that uh, that's the first time I thought this, and more and more I think it, because he, he gives the Yankees a versatility and a left-handed bat that can subtly be far more powerful than you think at Yankee Stadium. Make contact, hit fly balls, pull the ball down the line, hey, Perfect guy for them. Absolutely perfect. Now, I don't know if they can get him. Like I said, it's difficult for the Yankees and Mets to make any kind of deal. We know that. Now to the Mets for a second. Big win yesterday. 
you know, they had some great at-bats against Chapman. You know how Chapman gets. You know, my theory watching Chapman as often as I have, and especially in recent years, when he walked, when he walked Alvarez to start the inning, and Alvarez got a quality walk because you had to battle it off, take really tight pitches. He was having trouble getting the fastball over the plate. He was painting the corner with the slider. I don't love the slider anyway. But he still throws the ball hard. But once he walks the leadoff hitter, you know he's going to walk somebody else. And it wasn't like he was like he can come in and load the bases where he's just crazy wild and he can't throw the ball near the plate. He was just missing. And in the Alvarez walk and then the Iglesias walk, which he fouled off three or four really good pitches with two strikes and took a couple of really tight pitches to get his walk, which got Lindor to the plate. Lindor got a base hit, two-run score. They go on to win the game. So... It looked like the Mets were going to lose a tough one after taking the lead in the eighth and then having Diaz blow it in the bottom of the eighth. Instead, they come back with two in the ninth against Chapman on the Lindor single, and they get a 3-2 win. Very good win for them. Stop the three-game losing streak. Now they go for the uh, driving the class. They must have heard five times how the Mets won the series against the Pirates. Yeah, really? The fourth game of the series is today. So I, no one paid attention to the wraparound. There's a wraparound today at uh, 12, I think 1230, Scott against Keller. So uh, they play this afternoon in Pittsburgh before the Mets go home to play Washington and Colorado. If the Mets could get a win here in this game today, very big positive. They'd come home over 500, six games at home against bad teams with a chance to go four and two and then hit the break three games over 500 which would be a very big thing, very big thing for the Mets as they go shopping. Now, if you've listened to me through the years, you know I care very little about All-Star games. Very little. I don't care. I don't really care when somebody doesn't make the team. I don't care very much about the game itself. I don't like All-Star games. I never have. Um, I don't think they're any big deal. I think people overrate the baseball All-Star game. I think they always have. The other All-Star games, football, as we know, I said for years, shouldn't have an All-Star game. Now they don't. And in sports where the people have to play defense, you can't have an All-Star game. In baseball, you can have an All-Star game because pitching is defense, but it's an individual art. So you can have an All-Star game. It's the game that is far more conducive because basketball is a joke with no defense, it's far more conducive to the real game than any other All-Star game. I'll give you that. But it's still over, vastly overrated. Now, and it's become far less important when you can see all the players play all the time, which you didn't in the old days. In the old days, the only time you saw some of these National Leaguers was in an All-Star game or a World Series. You didn't see them a lot as a kid. That's why the All-Star game was big. But I never was hung up on the All-Star games. Even as a little kid, I was not hung up on All-Star games. Now, the one thing I will say, though, is I thought Nimmo deserved to make the All-Star team. I'm sure when the defections start and a lot of guys who are either don't want to go or are injured and won't go, and they start naming guys, which is what's going to happen starting today, I'm sure Nimmo will get added, and he should. Um, I thought he deserved to go, and I'm not knocking that Pete made the All-Star team. Good for Pete. I didn't think he had an All-Star first half, but he's an All-Star player. He's an All-Star slugger, and they want Pete there because he agreed, I guess, to play in the uh, in the Home Run Derby, to participate in the Home Run Derby, and they need him to participate in the Home Run Derby. They need him. He's a, he's a star attraction there. He's always a heavy favorite, even though he didn't do well last year. But he has 18 homers, didn't have a great first half. Nimmo has 55 runs scored, 53 
uh, 53 RBIs. He's done a good job. He's got a lot of big hits. You know, in his last 15 games, he's been on fire. His last 30 games, he's been on fire. I mean, uh, he he's done a very good job. You know, he's got 17 doubles, 13 homers, 53 RBIs, um, 370 on base percentage. I thought he's had a good year. I really do. He's got a higher OPS than Alonzo does, but I'm not, this is not, I'm not knocking Alonzo. But I thought Nimmo was the most deserving guy. And, you know, it's it's hard to get guys there. And, and Alonzo is an attraction, which Nimmo isn't. I understand that. But I thought Nimmo deserved to make the All-Star team. Uh, I really did. So, like I said, I don't make a big deal about this. I really don't. Um, but I'd like to see him make it because I think he's worked really hard. And a guy like that, I think, would be incredibly appreciative of it, of making it. 32 first-time All-Stars was what I saw. Boy, talk about changing of the guard. 32 first-time All-Stars. Wow. I mean, that's that's the headline. There's a lot of young kids, a lot of new faces and that's what baseball will be selling at the All-Star game. And that's good for the sport to have all those new faces at the All-Star game. 32. I mean, that is, that's outrageous. It really is. So uh, we'll see what happens as far as them. I think he'll make it. I think, like I said, there's guys who are going to be injured and guys who aren't going. I think there's already three guys in the National League. They said aren't going to go. So... From that standpoint, I think he makes it, and that's a good thing for him. Now, both teams are going to hit the All-Star break. The All-Star break is late in the schedule. It's a sprint when it's over. The Mets are right in the middle of this wild-card thing. And in the National League, it is a wild-card thing. There are so many teams right there. You have St. Louis, San Diego, Arizona, the Mets, San Francisco, even Pittsburgh, within four games of the wild card. That's a lot. The Mets are two out. If you take St. Louis, which is the second wild card after Atlanta, at 42 losses, the Mets are 44 losses. It's really going to be like that where it's going to change. If you go, if you have a three-game losing streak or a three-game winning streak, you're going to jump a bunch of teams or fall behind a bunch of teams. It's going to be like that the whole second half. And the Mets are right in the middle of it. And they have to see what they can do. They obviously are going to rely heavily on their bullpen, so they need to add bullpen people. They need Diaz to be good. They hope to get Senga back, because that would be like adding a big player if you can get Senga back. Even if he's got a pitch on a six-man rotation, getting Senga back would be big, because he's good. And let's see how aggressive they get in adding something. For the Yankees... Mets don't need a bat. Mets need pitching, pitching, pitching. Yanks need pitching, but they could also use a bat. You know, I don't know what they can get out of Rizzo. Getting Stanton back will be a big positive because he'll offer a judge and sort of protection. You know, one of the things, and he had a couple of hits this weekend, but one of the things that has really happened to this Yankee season is... Volpe and Verdugo have had very tough stretches. Verdugo, since he hit the wall in Fenway. Uh, Volpe, after a very promising start, has had a real rugged couple of months. And he's got to be better for them. They need to pick that up with those guys. They need those guys to contribute. And I don't know what they can get out of Lemayu. He did hit a ball off the wall last night. I don't know what they can get out of Rizzo. That's why they may need a guy who can give them some versatility. They don't need to go get Guerrero. They don't need Guerrero. They just need some guys who can get on base, you know, get a base hit, hit an occasional home. But they don't need a slugging right-handed bat. They got Stanton for that. 
They just need some consistency in the lineup, which they haven't had. And they have, let's be honest, you got to be fair here, they have drastically missed Stanton's bat in the lineup. But their pitching has not been good for a while. It was last night. He did a good job. Just gave up the home of Devin. Devin's performance, the second home run he hit, hey, that pitch was a pitch I don't think too many guys could hit out of ballpark. They wanted the pitch off the plate and up. You got the pitch off the plate and up to a left-handed batter, and he put the ball out of the ballpark in right center field. I mean, that was an incredible display. So was the bare hand play he made in the inning before against LeMayu. That was a great play. Now, the Rice thing. I'm going to call it the Rice thing for this reason. The three home run performance, which may put him in a very odd category depending on what his future, where his future lies, but it is going to put a lot of pressure on him. See, he didn't have any pressure. He got off to a decent start. It wasn't a great start. It was a decent start. Then he hit a homer. And then he had a three homer seven RBI day, which elevated him to now, you know, all of a sudden, hey, this guy, he's the next, you know, Mattingly. You know, whoa, calm down. He has done a nice job so far. And I'm not even going to make a, you know, even say anything about the fact last night he had a tough night. You know, there's going to be plenty of tough nights. But you don't want to all of a sudden, because he had a big night. And remember, he's only had a handful of at-bats so far. He's been up 55 times. He got 75% of his homers and 50-something percent of his RBIs in one game. Now, he has gotten base hits. He has gotten some walks. So his, you know, his numbers so far have been, you know, he's got 360 on base. Since for the Yankees is glowing. He's got a 900 OPS because he's hit the four home runs this week. But calm down here. Don't ask too much of this guy. And when Rizzo's healthy, you got to give Rizzo his job back and le- see what he has. It's not like you're going to just say, all right, right, saw a guy, and we're not giving Rizzo his job back. He had a great day. You know, everything fell into place. I don't know if he's going to be a keeper or not in the long run. I mean, he looks professional at the plate. But it's only been 50 at-bats. you got to take that with very much a grain of salt and not put too much pressure on him. And if he's here and he's playing every day in August, September, there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. That's a lot to ask. So, again, he had a day. But right now, if you subtract that one day, it's a whole different ballgame in his 50 at-bats. So you got to take that a little bit with a grain of salt right now and just let's try to be calm and realistic about the whole thing. The Yankees can't get out of their own way because – so many things have hit at the same time. The starting pitching, which had been glowing early in the season, had been unbelievable, has, you know, crashed, completely crashed. They haven't been good out of the pen late. Holmes hasn't been good out of the pen. Holmes has hit a slump here. And as I've told you before, I could think of at least three games where Holmes was incredibly lucky to get a save and not a, and not a blown save or a loss. 
That's how bad it was. So he's got to do better. And they need more consistency because, hey, they were losing when Judge was ripping the cover off the ball. You had to hit a spot where Judge, unless Judge was going to just, you know, hit 80 home runs and knock in, you know, 190 runs, he had to hit a dry spell. What he did after the bad start was insane. His first half is unbelievable. I mean, Soto's is really MVP-like, and Judge's is so much better than that. It's one of the best first halves in the history of baseball. So you had to cool off some. I'm sure this is confounding that team right now because there's a lot of things that have gone sour at the same time. Plus, I understand Boone wants to protect his players, but I've seen instance after instance of them either pulling a rock or not hustling, and he has not given them a hard time at all. And I think he's really been negligent in that area. You can't let him get away with all that stuff all the time. Make excuses for him. So it's going to be very interesting. Very interesting. This week we'll be telling. Do the Yankees limp home and have another terrible six games? Or do they find something here in these last couple of days before the break? In what are big games in Tampa? And then three big ones with the Orioles. You know, there's a tragedy in the NFL, I'm sure you've seen, where this young defensive back for the Vikings who played at Alabama and Oregon, cornerback, Kyrie Jackson, was killed with, along with two of his former high school teammates in a traffic accident in Maryland. these high-speed drag races. And I guarantee you, I don't care. If you're listening to this right now, and I don't care if you drive the Jersey Turnpike, the BQE, the LIE, okay, uh, any major thoroughfare, the Merit, go take, uh, you know, the Hutch, I don't care what road you want to mention. The Thruway, the New York Thruway, I don't care. Name any big road. And I guarantee you, you can tell me you have been on that road. When there's plenty of traffic on that road moving at a steady clip, and we all drive too fast on these roads, we all know that. But here's the deal. I guarantee you, you've seen times where you're like, Look at these cars swerving in and out, and they seem to be racing. I had one on the 4th of July. I was on the LIE. And I was in the lane next to the HOV lane going east at about 2 p.m. to a family 4th of July party out east. It was... I'd say moderately heavy traffic. I was going about 70 in the lane next to the HOV. I wasn't in the HOV. Remember, the HOV is not an HOV lane on the holiday. And we've all had those cars zoom around you and then cut in and out of lanes. And you're saying, what are these people going to wind up you know, in the trees somewhere? Well, I had two come past me, and you can see them coming in your rearview mirror. And I saw the truck coming in the HOV lane, and it was coming at about 95 or more. It was flying. I was going 70, and it was flying. And then I saw out of the corner of my eye this Mercedes come over three lanes and head towards the HOV lane. And right in front of me, they were on a collision course 
at such a high speed where they got to within, I swear, an inch of each other and then parted and actually got clearance and didn't hit each other by some act of God. Because I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to go as they collide. That's how bad the collision looked like it was going to be. We've all seen that. We just saw this poor kid die that way. We know that the accident in Dallas with the chief player, Rice, and his buddies. We see this all the time now. This crazy speeding and this drag racing inside traffic and jumping lanes. I don't know how they can police this. But something has to be done because it is a miracle that we don't hear more and see more. Now, we see some horrific accidents. I was just watching one on the news where the guy took his family out for ice cream who stopped at a light and got hit at 100 and something miles an hour. We know what happened at that nail salon on Long Island where the guy, he was drunk, though, and he wasn't young, and he was, he was you know, ossified, and he drove it into the, into the store. You know, horrific tragedy to kill four people. That's drunken driving. That's another problem. Uh, driving under the influence, driving drunk, or looking at your phone, which has become as big a problem as drunk driving. And I'm not trying to do a public service message here, but you know what? I just experienced this where I actually thought I couldn't avoid an accident. And then you see this kid, and you wonder how you're going to get across to what you figure are mostly these young people. We all understand how people like to go fast in cars when they're young. And you try and talk to your own kids about it, and you try to, you know, and you understand what goes on when you're young, you know, understand what you did when you were young. So no one's saying that, you know, you're blameless or that you didn't speed, or the, but it has reached an absurd level at the way they're darting in and out of traffic with these cars, and you just wonder why there isn't more of these where they wind up in the trees or in a you know, mass of metal in the middle of the road and take th- you know, f- three or four innocent cars with them. So considering how much this goes on, I think the surprising thing that we don't hear more about athletes like this, and you just wish there was a way to get through to people or some way to police it better because this goes on all the time, and I guarantee you, anybody listening to this, you might be driving right now as you listen to this, it happens in front of all, we all see it and just shake our heads as somebody cuts you off at some high speed and then darts the other way and in and out of traffic, and, they, and then you realize there's another car right behind them and they're playing a game. It is insanely dangerous. I don't say that now because I'm a senior citizen. I said, you know, it's just using your, you know, your brain. This can can't continue, and to have a kid, anybody, anywhere, not just the kid who was a promising cornerback, but have anybody perish because of this kind of behavior, you just wish you could stop it. But it is rampant, absolutely rampant. Have a seat. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.